In a must-win game against the Arizona Coyotes, the Jets definitely got the victory, but it wasn't as clean as you'd like, and it felt like the Jets fell into bad habits, kind of showcased why they're continuing to struggle, especially with finishing, and also just didn't really seem all that convincing, especially once they took a 2-0 lead. We'll dive into this game and some con continuous problems with the Jets as they enter the playoffs on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. As always, thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on all of your favorite podcasting platforms, wherever you get them, and YouTube. It is free to do so, and it ensures you never miss another episode. Tonight's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more and visit FanDuel.com locked up slash locked on today to get started. Now, like I said at the top of the episode, the Jets did uh, actually beat the Arizona Coyotes. Wasn't a game that I think the Jets are going to be as thrilled with as, as you'd expect a team really fighting for a playoff spot to be. Uh, I know that two points, however you get them, is always really important, right? Especially when you're the Jets and you're fending off a number of teams behind you who are, are rapidly closing the distance to Winnipeg and trying to put pressure on the Jets, even though at times they themselves haven't exactly been great uh, on their quest for the playoffs. But, you know, for standing stuff, obviously this evening wasn't the most helpful for Winnipeg. Nashville beat the uh, the Buffalo Sabres 7-3, and Calgary crapped on the Anaheim Ducks 5-1. So, Getting both points was kind of critical for the Jets. Winnipeg, one way or another, had to defeat the Yotes and emerge victorious. And it wasn't like the Yotes are actually like a pushover. Arizona, for the past couple of games, has actually been on something of a winning streak. I mean, they were uh, like 6-1-2 uh, and two or something like that in their last set of games. So not exactly a squad that I think the Jets could really take lightly. Uh, certainly, um, Winnipeg, not exactly a team doing all that well either. And and I think this Yotes team was a perfect opportunity to restore some confidence, maybe get the Jets feeling uh, like they can handle this and, and get through this, this recent shooting percentage slump that they're going through, some of the defensive struggles and just lack of engagement. But I think what kind of bothered me with this game is, is that, you know, we, we know that Winnipeg is kind of built to get an early lead and then defend, right? We know how Bones is. He is a little bit of an older school coach at times. Sometimes he'll have some really cool things like um, Connor Dubois and whoever else on the wing. Other times, though, he'll over uh, overuse certain players that he thinks are defensively resolute when, honestly, they're actually the worst defenders on the team, especially if the Jets are being passive and defending a lead like we saw in this game. And I, I think for the Jets, you know, there were questions and concerns coming into this evening about what is Winnipeg's effort level? What is their commitment? And Dubois had some funny things kind of noted about that. He said stuff like, you know, if you're playing well, you're going to score. And all of that should feed into goal scoring. If we do well, if we just believe, it, you know, things will work out. But I think we all know the problems with the Jets run a lot deeper than that. Uh, and sure, you know, the first half of the season was fun. But I think, you know, peripherally speaking, there were concerns that at some point the fun ride would kind of end. And I think we've seen uh, the worst of that over the past month or two. But, you know, I think when I look at how this team is deployed, who is being used a lot, sometimes it's the worst defenders for Winnipeg's bad habits. I mean, Shifley and Connor have been horrendous together recently, and yet they continue to be among the leaders in, you know, time on ice. And it makes me wonder why you know this line is continually relied upon when that combo just doesn't really work uh i mean connor and shifley both have issues with defensive marking it's not not exactly a secret that both of them will cheat for offense kfc a lot more frequently than than shifley does but 
you know, all the same, we know that that combo, no matter who is there uh, on the right side, usually just isn't going to work out. So that's a pairing that I think needs to be split up. Um, I, I also feel like Wheeler at this point, he's just not able to keep up anymore. I mean, it's it's been really noticeable, I think, the past few months. We've kind of talked about it over the past couple of years, but really, he is like slowing down badly. Uh, he's not completing passes. He's struggling to adjust and turn his body in time to make reads. Uh, pass receptions have been kind of off. When he has time and space to make plays, he can still do some really cool stuff. But, you know, most of that you would expect to come on the power play. And guess what? The power play isn't scoring. They're like 0 for 19 in their last five or so games, which, yikes, that's pretty freaking bad. Um, the Jets actually look more dangerous shorthanded than they do on the power play. And that really should never happen. Uh, I know that, you know, the Jets will occasionally cheat for breakaways on on the PK, but for the power play to struggle as much as it has, I just can't begin to explain it. I think the problems, if you actually want to take a tactical look at it, are not exactly hard to spot. You know, very static puck possession, uh, the same two to three players continually taking shots, and a, a general poor understanding of how to move the puck quickly and stretch the, the PK diamonds around. That all is stuff that, you know, coaching staffs could address. But I guess I wonder why they continue to go back to the same well and not adjust the strategy. We saw a couple of power plays this evening in which the Jets actually moved the puck a lot faster and things started to open up. There were more scoring chances, better shots. But I guess the prevailing theme of this game is that the Jets just didn't really feel like they were in control. Uh, I know the Yotes have won a number of games recently, but by the same token, this is also an Arizona team that is Bedard bound. So why are the Jets, who claim to be a playoff contender, struggling to maintain a 2-0 lead? I think that is a question that's going to keep a lot of people up at night. Um, and I think for this Jets team, I just don't know if they really have the mentality anymore. And with like 10 games left in the season, this is like the worst possible time to have a situation where you have a crisis of confidence. This Jets team needs to believe in itself, and it just doesn't. And that's a problem that we've seen over and over again over the past few years. So a lot of work to be done. Um, but, I mean, at, at this point, I just don't even know what to do with the Jets. I think Winnipeg is just going to have to ride it out and see. Uh, in a little bit, I kind of wanted to talk about, I guess, the next year or two for Winnipeg, because obviously the season's coming to a close. The Jets are probably going to make the playoffs and probably get eliminated pretty quickly. So, you know, the summer and, and what happens with this team, especially with the hints that we've been given from the front office, I think we're setting ourselves up for what could be a bit of a bloodletting. And then towards the end of the show, I don't want to take some time to talk about the World Baseball Classic because I think what's happening with the WBC is a really good example of how you can grow the game organically uh, and how that could actually be uh, a big catalyst for hockey, right? International hockey is something that we don't really get enough of. And I think these tournaments that we're seeing, especially with how great the World Baseball Classic was, highlight when you look at non-traditional markets and really bring the sport and export it to other countries, uh, to international audiences, all of that fun stuff. So we'll spend some time on that later. But before we get to any of this stuff, including uh, the Jets' recent struggles and all that, I did want to shout out our friends and partners at FanDuel. The tournament for March Madness is heating up, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. New customers get a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's bonus, bonus bets back if your first bet does not win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's free, safe, and secure, and of course, very easy to use. You can do everything from betting on money lines to point scores to the number of three is strained, which for a lot of you is probably a big deal. Maybe you want to give your bracket challenge a bit of a second life, especially after so many first round upsets. Maybe you even want to predict some scores. Or maybe you have a couple of favorite college players or NBA players, especially as the NBA season continues to roll along. Maybe you want to cast some bets on that. FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So you can get all of your fun stuff all together. And best of all, they have a rapid cash out as well. Don't miss your chance to get your no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. 
I just wanted to kind of circle back and bring us back to uh, the next year or so for the Jets. Um, in, increasingly, I'm starting to get the sense what Winnipeg is planning is not going to be super popular with a fan base. I think we got some hints of it at the trade deadline this year. The Jets not exactly using $4 million or so in cap space. Winnipeg also not really committing a lot of trade assets, um, in particular futures, which for the Jets, they've always claimed that they're a draft and develop team. Everyone is, right? Everyone drafts and develops. It's not exactly a secret. But I think what Winnipeg is trying to intimate um, and imply is that, yeah, they don't really sign free agents or make big, splashy deals uh, for players under contract or, um, you know, really big money prospects that require you, to, require you to give up a lot of draft capital. Winnipeg just doesn't really do that. They prefer to develop internally and hope that their prospects become part of their future core. But let's be real. We know that the Jets have struggled to actually go from drafting to graduating uh, to full-time NHL roles. So that whole vision kind of out the door. Um, but, you know, with how this team is and, and the direction it's trended, uh, some of the rumors that have come out about Shifley um, and honestly people talking about Hellebuck as, you know, at some point being a Hall of Famer, how important he is, how valuable he is, doesn't it start to make you think that maybe the Jets are thinking about a future without a lot of these guys? Winnipeg already knows that Pierre-Luc Dubois is on the move and, and will be going probably to Montreal, but maybe some other team trades for him in the meantime. Uh, but Shifley, I think, was one of the big names that's kind of been, you know, is he is he or isn't he kind of a question, right? And I think that has been uh, a bit of a challenge to answer. Winnipeg just doesn't really seem to know if Shifley is super committed or not. Um, but increasingly, it feels like they've determined he's not that committed, and it seems like they're trying to gauge interest. And I think for a guy of his caliber, uh, a player, a star player on a one-year deal who can help just about any team that wants to be a real contender, I think Shifley would command a haul. Uh, and I don't just say that because I'm a biased Jets fan. I really do think Shifley would really net some big, big like futures and stuff. And I get the sense Winnipeg is thinking about it more because they know Dubois is going. They know Shifley may or may not leave pretty soon here. And I'm going to guess that they have a feeling Hellebuck might be interested in testing free agency and leaving Winnipeg altogether. And I think for the Jets, they cannot accept losing anyone for free. The only players that they really seem to give away are like, you know, underrated middle six guys. Uh, I'm thinking of Mikey Isamon, um, uh, you know, Svechnikov going to the Sharks and all that. So stuff like that, I think Winnipeg doesn't really worry about. But when it comes to big ticket free agents and stuff, Winnipeg does not like letting players walk in free agency. Uh, so I, I just have this feeling that we're getting closer and closer to Winnipeg thinking about blowing it up. I think they need to save money for some internal budgeting stuff. I think they're concerned about the lack of performance, attendance, and you know the COVID financial implications. All of that have not been great for the past couple of years. And so the Jets are kind of, I don't know, running up against the wall a bit. And it makes me wonder, you know, why, if all of these problems are surfacing now, did you not commit to winning before? Why didn't you make the moves that you needed to to put this team in a better position? I mean, if Winnipeg had made different decisions uh, a few years ago, especially after that cup run, don't you think we might have been in a better spot now? It's too late to cry over spilled milk, but I think Winnipeg, you know, thinking about the future and maybe considering like a retool or a rebuild, it, it should be a problem for fans. I'm not saying it's the wrong choice necessarily, but I think as a fan, I'd be kind of pissed if... I'd spent all this time watching this core, watch this team continually build out year after year and and run it back, really, with the same group for the most part and deliver the same results. I mean, I, why would anyone want to support a team like that? Why would anyone want to watch a team like that? Uh, and it's a question that I think a lot of Jets fans have asked themselves recently. You know, season ticket renewals are down. Attendance is down. Viewership is probably down as well. I don't have the figures on that, but just spitballing. And I think the Jets themselves have kind of recognized that things are flagging because we're seeing more and more discount promos, more and more community nights, a lot of ways to try and work around the problem of uh, fan engagement that's been, you know, again, on the steady decline. So, you know, the Jets, their motto is like fueled by passion, but it doesn't really feel like that anymore, right? It sort of feels like we're fueled by mediocrity and just being happy to be here. This Jets team, though, really feels like it should be more than that. I mean, this team has some amazing players, some amazing talent, 
and it's just a waste to see it continually being squandered with a, a leadership group that hasn't really shown what their vision of this team is. Uh, you know, if the vision sucks at this point, I don't care. At least it would be nice to know uh, what I'm getting into and what we're all sort of you know subscribing for. But it is what it is. I mean, teams will always play close to the, close to the best, and I don't expect anything to change. So, you know, I've I've kind of given up getting particularly mad about Winnipeg. It is what it is. Like as I've said, I've just sort of accepted that there are things that I will never really be happy with, uh, and that helps me enjoy the hockey more. But only to a degree when uh, you're struggling to beat the Arizona Coyotes and, and teams like the Blues. So let's hope Winnipeg turns it around and figures this crap out before, you know, the end of the regular season. Ten games left, not feeling confident about it, but perhaps uh, there is a surprise in store. Now, like I said, I also wanted to take a bit of a sidebar before we close out and talk about some really interesting lessons that we've taken away from the World Baseball Classic and how it might really help the NHL, especially as the NHL's press recently has not been good. Uh, the Pride jersey stuff with teams canceling, uh, the new Fanatics jersey deal. Yeah, the NHL not exactly having the best of PR stuff. But then I look and see the World Baseball Classic and think to myself, how cool would it be to have um, international hockey again be a pretty routine thing? We'll dive into some of the magic moments and why I think this is stuff that really you know, the NHL could do itself a world of favor by taking advantage of in just a moment. Before we go any further, though, I do want to shout out our friends and partners at Indeed. No matter how the last game you, uh, went or, or anytime you're taking the field, you've got a shot at greatness. But you're also surrounded by a team, and you want to give your best uh, shot to the team by recruiting more MVPs with Indeed. If you're hiring, you need Indeed because, you know, Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one spot. Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements, or else you don't pay a dime. Instead of spending hours on multiple job listings and constantly promoting and pumping your listings, Indeed helps you find everything you need all in one spot, and they're a super powerful, very helpful, very convenient hiring partner. They offer a customized service called Instant Match, which you know, allows you to sponsor a post. And as soon as you do, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes in, on Indeed that match your job description. You can invite them to apply it right away. And again, like I said, you only pay for quality applications that meet your needs. Personally, I think Indeed is fantastic. I've used it as an applicant myself. It's always very convenient, very straightforward. Uh, and whether you're a hiring partner or somebody who's just looking to apply for jobs, indeed really could not be easier to use right now with a 75 dollars sponsored job credit you can upgrade your post at indeed.com slash locked on that offer is valid through march 31st again you have to go to indeed.com slash locked on to claim your 75 dollars credit uh before march 31st indeed.com slash locked on terms and conditions apply need to hire you need indeed Hello, friends. Welcome back to these closing thoughts on tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, uh, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Like I said just a minute ago, I wanted to take some time and talk about the World Baseball Classic and how I feel it could inform uh, the NHL's push to really market hockey to other places, right? I think the NHL recently has started to see that things are, are stagnating and sliding. And so you know, this new Fanatics jersey deal, I, I'm personally not a fan of Fanatics, got a lot of uh, mixed feelings on their business model and how they've done things. But, you know, for the average fan, right, we're all expecting uh, sports fan gear prices to jump with how Fanatics is basically controlled just about every part of the process. And it, it really shows that the league is looking for pure profits at this point and trying to grow that way rather than thinking about more organic options. And that's kind of where, like, the World Baseball Classic for me is fascinating, right? The MLB has kind of not been um, as happy about some of the stuff that's happened with the WBC just because of, like, injuries. But, I mean, the players love it. The fans love it. It's one of the most electrifying tournaments that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, the final between Japan and USA, plus the semifinals between uh, Mexico and Japan, uh, Venezuela's run. I mean, so many fascinating stories, so many amazing games. 
And I, I watch that and I'm just like, why doesn't hockey have this more frequently? I know the World Cup of Hockey is like a pain to organize, but international hockey friendlies, I think all of that would do a world of good to really exposing uh, other countries and other fan bases uh, to more hockey viewership. I mean, I feel like the sport has amazing potential abroad. We already know how much Europe loves it. If you've ever seen some of those videos of the European fan atmosphere, you know they're crazy out there. You know they're nuts. Uh, and it's just it's, it's 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 amazing that the NHL hasn't really tapped into more of that. I think international hockey and international sports can be one of the most compelling, most amazing sites. And for the NHL to continually not give it that much attention until it's time for like the Olympics, it feels like a missed opportunity. And it's not like other leagues don't do this, but to see how well the WBC went, how much it really grew the sport in just a few weeks, it's hard not to see that and think of all the potentials the NHL has just sitting there in front of them. We have so many uh, players from abroad and from other non-traditional markets. Why not invest in that and help them you know, come to the forefront, show them how great hockey can be, how wonderfully exciting it is, and help you know young prospects and kids envision themselves one day lacing up for their favorite teams and hopping in, whether they're representing their country or a specific club that they've chosen. So, yeah, I mean, the WBC, obviously there are certain things about it that make it very uh, viewer friendly. And certainly for, you know, you know, the Japanese fan base, it was an incredible draw. But I feel like if the NHL goes to something similar and really looks at the next World Cup of Hockey as a major opportunity, I think that there could be so much fun to be had. Uh, you know, we saw, what was it, that team uh, North America. I mean, that was like the coolest thing ever. All these like under 25, under 24 kids all together on one super team fell just a bit short. But I mean, for the few weeks that we got to have them, one of the most exciting parts of the tournament. Bring that stuff back. Let me know your thoughts on the World Baseball Classic. And if you think, you know, the NHL really needs to invest more in international hockey, drop your thoughts and feelings in the comments below. Or at my social medias at H Living Loco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. I thank you so much for listening and making us your first listen of the day every day. Make your second listen locked on game to game with NHL's uh, with the NHL show. Every moment, every top performance, every result locked on game to game gives you all of the games from across the NHL with local anal- analysis that only locked on can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NHL available on the Odyssey app and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great night and go Jets go.